grace and peace to you from God, creator, savior, and Holy Spirit. This is the third week that we're talking about things that are real. Real God, real community, and today, real purpose. Our Micah reading for today ends with some very beloved words, but I don't want to rush to get there. The text study group was a little frustrated with me because they wanted to get there and I kept pulling them back to earlier into the passage. I think in order for us to grasp the meaning of these words, we have to understand, get a feeling for what comes before that. What is the message that Micah is entrusted to carry to the people? And does that message have anything to do with us today? Micah was a poor farm kid from a southern town in rural Judah. He ends up called speaking to the folks in the north. And what he's got to say to start with is, things aren't going so well for you guys in Samaria and Jerusalem and all. And trouble is coming. Trouble's coming from Assyria. It's coming from Babylon. And the news isn't good. The people have made a mess, and this can't go on anymore. And I need the next slide, which I don't think I put in there. There we go. We hear that God is coming, the God like from on top of Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning bolts and earthquakes to speak to the people because things are out of control. Cities are going to be destroyed, but why? Why? Micah says it's because the leaders and the prophets are all cheating, stealing, greedy, in things for the money. Have you ever gotten to know anything about a politician, a leader? and wondered if they were in it for the money? Wonder if their campaign meant more than the people they serve? I wonder. And what about prophets? These prophets were willing to tell people whatever they wanted to hear, as long as they got paid. Do we have prophets like that today? Do we have prophets that'll tell you that God wants you to be happy and God wants you to have everything you can think of that you might want? Does God to, does, are there prophets that'll tell you to hold up your Bible and picture that new car in your driveway? Sure. We have prophets like that, don't we? Well, what about the other kind of prophets that'll tell us what we want to hear? Yeah, you're right. God hates those people that you hate too. And they are outside of the circle of God's caring. And as long as I keep making money and can go home to my mansion, it's all good. This can't go on, Micah tells the people. Destruction is coming. And God will appear. After each one of these things that, that Micah tells the people about their awful destruction that's coming, he also raises some hope. Things are never hopeless. And here he reminds them that there will be a shepherd again one day who will gather up those who are still faithful and continue to lead them. But then Micah talks about another injustice. Injustice of Israel's leaders this time, there are leaders who are taking people's land. It was illegal at that time to take away even a poor person's land for any reason. They were supposed to have that. They were committing an injustice. In January of 2013, 10 major banks and mortgage companies were charged with illegally foreclosing on people's homes and forcing them out when they should have been allowed to stay. Together they settled 
to pay $8.5 billion, $8.5 billion. People were forced out of their homes, and the banks and the mortgage companies profited. How much do you suppose was really owed to those people? I knew one family pushed out of their house in just this way, ended up declaring bankruptcy, and no one wanted to hear their story or believe that it was real. Micah says this cannot keep happening. There will be a destruction, but after destruction, a new Jerusalem will rise, a place where people will gather and finally we'll have peace on earth. Then a new character enters the scene in Micah of foretelling of a king coming from Bethlehem, a king who will be king in this new kingdom. And in this new kingdom, God's people will bless all those around them and they will stand up against evil. This is where we enter today in chapter six. And God is challenging Israel. It's a scene like in a courtroom. It's God versus the people. And the first thing that happens is that nature itself is called to bear witness. The mountains are called out to hear the case. The foundations of the earth are called on to hear God's case against Israel. And God gives the opening arguments. He starts more by saying what have I done to you what have I done to you that you act like you've had such a bad deal answer me I brought you out of Egypt I freed you from being slaves I gave you Moses and Aaron, Aaron and Miriam put those words together Aaron and Miriam to be your faithful leaders and do you remember when King Balak was trying to have you cursed? And I stopped Balaam, and you received the blessing intended for you instead? Have you forgotten all the lands that I gave you? Everything that's been provided for you? You ought to know what I'm like by now. You ought to know who I am. Why are you acting like this? <coughs> and the people... They don't even really make a case. They kneel down and they say, how shall I come before you, Lord? What shall I do to make up for all these sins? Shall we bring offerings, sacrifices? How about, how about a thousand-year-old calves? Or maybe a thousand rams, would that be good? How about 10,000 rivers of oil? Is that enough to make up for what we've done? Or should I give up my child, my flesh and blood, for the sins of my soul? They're, they're looking for answers in worship and sacrifice. But the verdict comes in. God has told you what is good. God has told you what is good. So what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. God wasn't looking for tribute, sacrifices to cover sins. God has told the people what is good. God has taught the people about the importance of relationships with God and with one another. And they have a purpose in the world, a real purpose to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. It is a beautiful purpose. 
and I understand why we can't wait to get there. But it isn't an easy one. It's full of things that people don't want to get involved with. Doing justice means standing up to things that sometimes take our breath away. Rude and sexist comments, discrimination of every kind. And doing justice means working to change systems that aren't fair. And you know, whenever a system isn't fair, somebody's getting the bad end of the deal, but somebody's getting the good end of the deal. And they aren't usually willing to give that up in order to balance the scales. People who benefit from these systems may be willing to fight you. Changing injustice isn't pretty or easy or painless. It can be dangerous. Think of those from the civil rights movement. Reverend Angela L. Ying wrote about that in a commentary on this text. She said, to do justice is not a romantic ideal or an abstract concept. Rather, I have found justice is excruciatingly hard work, for it asks us as people to work together, to truthfully critique the present unjust system and to find new alternatives to change the system. I was thinking about these systems this week and looking up all variety of, of things. One thing I was reading was about the living wage model that's, that com, comes out of MIT by Dr. Amy Glasmeyer and Carrie Ann Nadu. There, by their calculations, a living wage on an average, obviously, with differences in the country, would be about $15.84 an hour that kind of wage. At that wage, the way it works is a family of four with two full-time working adults could get by. But if we look at our federal minimum wage, that means in that same family of four with two working adults, both of those adults would need to work 78 hours a week in order to reach that same standard of living. And that living in wage doesn't include things like pre-prepared meals or going through a drive through or to a restaurant. There's nothing for entertainment. There's no unpaid vacation. And there's not anything extra to save. To save for the things that come up. To save for retirement. Things get complicated. If we use that same model, a single mother with two kids earning that federal minimum wage would need to work 142 hours a week. That's roughly 24 hours a day for six days. It can't be done. In a first world country, that does not seem like justice to me. So how do we do justice? How do we address something like that? How about a food pantry? Yes, absolutely. How about we work together in community to provide food? Like feed my people? Yes. Important, necessary. But these things also do not change the system. So there has to be more. And getting involved in this kind of systematic change is complicated. <coughs> and what about kindness? I was captured this week by the story of undocumented immigrants whose child was very seriously ill in Texas. And the child was at a hospital in Rio Grande Valley, Texas, that could not do the surgery that he needed. So they were going to need to go to Corpus Christi. But the problem was that there was a border patrol check between those two hospitals. And while they tried to figure out what to do, 
Somebody from ICE showed up at the hospital they were still at. They figured a nurse had called and turned them in. The agent said, we'll escort you to the hospital with the baby, but as soon as you get there, we're going to arrest you, and you may be deported. On this day, when your child is facing serious illness, possibly death, we ask, what matters most? Where is kindness? Where is mercy? If that doesn't seem harsh, then let's put it side by side with an, a little bit older news piece of a rich young man who stalked, attacked, assaulted a young woman. But our courts decided on a very lenient kind of punishment because, you know, he had such a bright future. Where is justice? Where is mercy? I thought it was callous and cruel. Taking on systems of injustice can be overwhelming, but it helps that we do it together, that we do it in real community, both as members of congregations, as Christians in an area, working together with all those who share same values across religious boundaries. And it helps to remember that God calls us to act as best we can. It's never our salvation at stake. Our relationship with God is never dependent on how this goes. Jesus saves us and frees us to do our best, to stumble, to fall, to learn to try again. We are called to walk humbly. And it's been suggested that this humble walking is about the relationships, the awareness of others, not putting yourself above them or below them, but walking together with God, aware of those around you with our eyes open. It's a message we've heard. What's most important? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbors as yourself. We are invited to walk with our real God, with our eyes on everything around us, acting together in community for real purpose for God's real purpose in the world. Amen.